there is no off season when it comes to the WNBA, at least as how we cover it at Lockdown Women's Basketball. And the next, James K is here to talk all things Chicago Sky. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Megdahl, thanking you for making us your first listen every day. You can subscribe wherever you get podcasts, including here on YouTube for video. And of course, make sure you are subscribing to thenexthoops.com, where our group of incredible, young, energetic reporters is covering the WNBA, women's college basketball, EuroLeague, you name it. Uh, For $9 a month or $72 a year, you are supporting the work of over 100 reported pieces every month, podcasts six days a week, numerous watch parties, thanks to our partnership with Playback, a full service women's basketball coverage experience and reporters who do this work so diligently. And when I say that, it's hard to think of anyone who exemplifies that more than James Kay, who I am delighted is joining me again to talk about the Chicago Sky, who are in the midst of a fascinating offseason. And so the Chicago Sky seem to have news going on and intrigue year round, James. You know, take me through just what it feels like to be a Chicago Sky beat reporter on a regular basis. It's crazy when you are covering some of the best players in the WNBA, like Candace Parker, Courtney Vandersloot, Ali Quigley. It's hard not being in the media section, just being like, oh my God, I'm just, I get to be a part of this, just watching all of this talent figure out how to make the pieces work. And even James Wade, who's become one of the best coaches in the WNBA, executives in the WNBA, it's just, it's kind of overwhelming at times, like, but at the same time, that's the fun of this, Howard. I mean, really, like, you be, you're able to, again, just cover something that's been undercovered for so long and, again, just be a part of this with all these athletes that, um, that I've at one point looked up to and now I, you know, have a professional relationship with. So it, it's, it's it, delightful to see. And, and this Candace Parker you speak of, you know, young up-and-coming young player, um, it sounds like, uh, we're getting another year of CP in the league to cover. Take me through what you're hearing from her. And and you wrote a terrific piece about this over at the Nets. What it means for the sky if they, in fact, retain her heading into 2023, which is not a sure thing. It's not a sure thing. But at the same time, I think when you begin to break down all the, the pros and cons for Candace coming back to the sky versus her going to Los Angeles, I believe that Richard Dice reported that she's probably like that she's most likely going to pick between those two destinations. And to me, the timing of all this is the most important part when we talk about Candace potentially coming back, because with the uncertainty around the Chicago sky right now, with a a lot of key pieces from last year's team and the championship team in 2021, just either potentially entering free agency or potentially retiring. I think the timing of Candace coming out and saying, you know, I'm game for a 16th season in the WNBA. If James Wade in the front office are going to try to bring Courtney Vandersloot back, who to me is the most important piece when we talk about the Chicago Sky's offense and defensively, I mean, what she does for them is something that I don't think a lot of people appreciate as much, but bringing her back, having this, these two, three months to be able to recruit can to recruit Courtney with the idea of, Hey, if Candace comes back, we're one of the more like one of the most unstoppable offenses in the WNBA. I mean, to to bring up a statistic here, I mean, in 863 minutes together, they had a 9.3 net rating and a 13.8 luck adjusted net rating with those two on the court. There's just not a lot of teams that can stop that duo. No, there's not a lot of teams who have put, posted that over a full season. Uh, interestingly, you know, and so you, you, you look at that specific. I also 
And it is equally interesting to me that Candace saying this now feels important for the sky because Azure Stevens is a free agent. Azure Stevens, to my mind, and maybe you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I've thought about it is if Candace doesn't come back, the sky essentially promote Azure Stevens. You bring her back in and you make her take on a lot of what Candace did. No one can replace Candace Parker, but in terms of skill set, broad based skill set. You could see that sort of overlap. But Azure is going to get paid. Somebody's going to pay Azure Stevens a lot of money. If you bring Candace back on anything other than, say, a Sue Bird style vet minimum contract, you're really not going to be able to do both. So doesn't that really change the way in which they can and even perhaps should go after Azure Stevens? Absolutely. I mean, it's not even just Azure Stevens. It's Emma Mieseman as well, who, again, like her and Candace, I don't think there's a, a – front court that's better when you have Kalia Copper, yeah. Emma Mieseman, and Candace Parker on the floor, and this advanced stats back that up. But as Ray Stevens, I mean, let's say Emma Mieseman doesn't come back over from Turkey where she's playing right now. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's hard to find a more qualified person who's on the bench than be elevated to that starting role. I mean, I think you, her and Brianna Jones honestly should be whispered in the same breath, quite honestly. They, I mean, Ezra Stevens, she only played, what, like just over 21 minutes a game last year. She's someone that started on a championship team in 2021 and proved to be someone that can bring the stretchability at the five, array shots at the rim, while also improving that spot-up jumper that she has worked really hard on. And that's the thing. Like, If Emma Mieseman's coming back to the WNBA and Ezra Stevens is a free agent looking, maybe looking for a bigger role and maybe some more money, I think that is, it becomes more complicated. They no longer have that luxury of having Azure Stevens on that $140,000 contract mm-hmm. along with, you know, all these other pieces on the roster. I mean, Allie Quigley took a pay cut. Clea Copper could have made more money in free agency last year. No doubt. Courtney Vandersloot did too. It's, it is the financial aspect of this is complicated up and down the roster. Are we assuming that Ali Quigley is not coming back at this point? Is that, um, you know, where you think the wind is blowing? I'm not reporting this by any means, but I do believe that Ali Quigley probably won't be coming back to the WNBA. And I I know that she was thinking about it last year. There was a lot of rumblings about that as well, um, even before the 2021 playoffs. And I do think it wouldn't surprise me if she came back. I mean, it's not not like her production is dropping off all too dramatically. And I do think though, that if I, if I had to put money on it and bet on one of our sponsors that uh, that is out here at the next, I would probably say that Allie Quigley is not coming back, but they all, it's not like the sky don't have options at the two spot either. I mean, Rebecca Gardner could slip in at the two after having a really fantastic rookie season in the WNBA quote unquote rookie season, I should say. And, not to mention Dana Evans, who's someone that offensively, I mean, she is a dynamic scorer who can give you a lot as well. So, but at this, I think that having that flexibility, I mean, I kind of could see Ali Quigley being like, it's going to be a 40 game season this year. Do I really want to put myself through that? It's tough. I mean, she's been playing basketball 11 months out of the year since 2008. So it, it, it is incredible what she has given to the game. We have no right to ask more of her. Uh, and so I understand that, too. I want to get into Dana and some more. Uh, but I do, in fact, also want to talk about one of our sponsors. So I'm glad that was a lovely segue, James. I very much appreciate <laughs> it. And that is Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional amateur league out there. And that matters to us that there is women's sports betting available over in Bet Online. You know, there's football, there's basketball, fine. There's NWSL soccer, there's NCAA women's basketball, there's the WNBA. It's all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. So, you know who didn't start was Dana Evans. And I think it's really interesting to me, you know, this is not a slight on Dana Evans at all. There is, in fact, a gap between, to my mind, the production 
that you've seen out of Dana Evans and the amount of opportunities that she has gotten. I, I know you're at work on a story about her for us as well, which I'm very excited about. Um, but I'd love you to just talk a little bit about what you've seen out of Dana Evans and sort of what you think she has a chance to be heading into year three in her in her WNBA career. I think Dana Evans, if again, if I was to go on bet online right now and try to find out who like what are the odds for most improved player Dana Evans would be at the top of my list of someone that I would want to bet on just because I do think she's going to see a spike in playing time next year, whether that's with the sky or elsewhere. I know she wants to get on the court a little bit more. And it, does she, I think the, the exact word she's like, I don't want to be a cheerleader, you know, like mm -hmm. she did well, by the way, as a teammate last year, you, you talked to her teammates and they talked about how supportive she was. But to me, I really do think that Dana is someone that, is going to excel more as a scoring guard than she is going to be like trying to be someone like Courtney Vandersloot. Like mm -hmm. I think there are more scoring guards than there are Courtney Vandersloots out in the world. I think Dana has proven, like I think about that first game in the uh, last year with the sky where she puts up what, like 17 points in the third quarter and just absolutely torches the sparks. And she's someone that I think is an underrated defender. Like I think, yeah. I wouldn't classify her as an energy defender anymore. Like she's not someone that's just going to stop you because she's just going to overwhelm you with the amount of effort she's putting in. It's like, mm -hmm. no, Dana has developed this, but she didn't showcase it as much last year just because she didn't have that time. And I think she's probably reached that point in her career where it's like, okay, I've, I've taken a back seat and probably wants to get more playing time. Just like any of us would, if we were committed to something like, you know, like five months out of your life, you know, um, it, it made sense. And, and I didn't, you know, just as sort of a point of personal privilege, I watched Dana Evans grow up before our eyes at Louisville. I had the honor of covering her during her time there. And the thing that I noticed about Dana was the jump from her sophomore to her junior year. I went back to make sure I wasn't misremembering this. She went from three and a half, three point attempts per game to seven three-point attempts per game in Jeff Walls' offense. And that year, she went from 38.8% from three to 43.1. And I bring it up because she is somebody, like many volume scorers, who needs the volume to truly be what she is capable of being. And, and that is a very rare thing in this league. Somebody who is able to create her own shot, was able to make her own offense, and is able to do so as efficiently as Dana Evans did. So the fact that you have her as a playmaker, you have her as an option for a one and a two, it just, it's just an opportunity to do a lot of different things. I just think she's really dangerous and really young and hungry. And like you talked about, eager to get out there on the court, she is not just happy to be there. So it's significant to me and exciting. I think it's going to be fascinating to see what comes next for Dana. But it also, I think in this league, there are certain players who their circumstances dictate upward pressure. And by which I mean, um, you know, Natasha Howard's been a great example of that in this league. She was a uh, very significant weapon off the bench for Indiana. Minnesota was able to give her more playing time. She goes to the Lynch. She plays extremely well with the Lynch. Well, that led her to being traded to Seattle, where she was a critical part of those storm teams, including one that won it all. And then from there on to New York, where she becomes a number two option, you know, and, and it feels to me like when we talk about the most improved players, so much of the time that comes down to opportunities as well. Uh, but when, with Dana, and we saw it in college at Louisville, with opportunities comes an increase in not just production, but efficiency. You know, I also could see her getting that opportunity with the sky, even with the veterans coming back. Mm -hmm. And Allie Quigley is the number one person that I think is going to determine whether that is something like if Dana can get 20 minutes per game with the sky, you know, and we don't know if Julie Aleman is going to be coming back either. I mean, she's with she signed with the sky, but I believe she has said that she kind of views her WNBA career like she assesses it year to year. Right. And which I think a lot of overseas players do. And when I look at the sky, like, I don't know, like when I, especially when it comes to Candace, I've been thinking about Candace and whether she's going to Chicago or LA so much ever since that podcast appearance with the, the athletic. Mm -hmm. And I just think about like, 
what the that number five pick that this guy have. I don't see them investing more in the youth on this team. Like I think that they're I think it would be wise for them to keep Dana and use that number five pick to probably improve the roster to go after that next championship. And I think a lot of like to be able to do something like that, to give up a pick as high as number five, mm-hmm. you have to have some trust with the youth on your roster while also hoping that the veterans can, you know, uh, make the most out of that last ride. True. By the way, I would also add, and our WNBA draft folks who do an amazing show every Saturday uh, with Hunter Cruz and M Adler and Joshua Welch, there does seem to be a bit of a gap between one through four and five. And so uh, a little bit on the wrong side of it. If you are in position at five to be able to go get a charisma Osborne, Haley Jones, a Diamond Miller, or, you know, of course, number one, Aaliyah Boston, that feels a little different than the players you're getting from five through 12. Absolutely. And just from all the draft prep that I've done, there are not a lot of players that I like necessarily for the sky and how they play where I like, like, I love Grace Berger out of Indiana. You and yeah. I are both have been riding the Grace Berger train for a while for now. Sure. Yeah. Well soon, Grace. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. But she's not someone that I feel like would necessarily excel with the sky necessarily. Like she does a little bit of everything, but like, I I think about like the perfect place for her to go. I mean, it's actually with the fever (laughs) for being Mm -hmm. quite honest. Um, And I, I really think when we talk about how James Wade has improved as an executive, as a general manager in this league, the last one, by the way, to be both the head coach and the general manager at this point, Mm -hmm. I think about how aggressive he is in trying to make improvements with the team. He's not afraid to draft Shyla Heal in like what with the seventh or eighth pick and kind of defy what a lot of people were expecting heading into that draft. He's not afraid to draft Katie Lou Samuelson and then flip her immediately the next year. Like yeah. he's willing to take big swings. And I kind of think that's what we're going to see here when the sky I don't I'd be really surprised if we see the sky pick with that number five pick. Uh when the WNBA draft comes this April. No doubt about it. Going to be fascinating to see. In terms of, just before we kind of jump out and end uh, this segment, I, I am curious what you think Rebecca Gardner's value is at this point. You know, she she had an unprotected contract last year. She obviously was so significant to this team in a variety of ways. She reminds me a little bit just from a contract value wise of what Sammy Whitcomb was in this league a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Sammy signed a uh, ridiculous three year, one hundred and fifty thousand dollar contract with the Seattle Storm back under the previous salary cap. So for all the value you got from Sammy Whitcomb on both sides of the ball, you were paying up fifty thousand dollars for a little more than a rookie scale at that time and below what you even see from rookies now. Uh, You know, what do you think is necessary? Does Rebecca have more leverage than she otherwise would because she's got this overseas career because she's further on or are we looking at somebody who because she's still on a reserved contract is going to have to take essentially what the sky give her i think it's a balance of both i think that any time a WNBA player or someone that like can play in the w like they they're always going to have the upper hand over teams it's just like oh you're not going to pay me what i'm worth like it's not worth having to play like back to backs and like it's it's just worth it to take the summer off in some cases. And I think with Rebecca Gardner, who actually tweeted out yesterday, she's like getting ready for year two. And so I've been, I've just been thinking a lot about how this offseason's been playing out, like how this offseason can play out for the sky. And if Ali Quigley retires, I I can really see Rebecca Gardner just slipping in at the two without any troubles. I mean she's someone that on the defensive end, the havoc that her and Kalia Copper can create on the perimeter is something that I think James Wade probably values. I mean, I think it's kind of what he had in mind in 2021 with Diamond Shields and Kalia Copper when they started against Washington yeah. with Allie Quickly coming off the bench. So you can't replace Allie Quickly's gravity. There's not one way to win. And I think that if, I mean, Rebecca, what the pressure that Rebecca Garner puts at the rim along with that perimeter defense where she was tasked in late in the fourth quarter to go up against some of the better guards in the league. I think that that's going to have value for the sky. And I think that's probably going to give Rebecca Gardner a pay raise to go along with it. 
it, it, it will be great to see. She certainly has paid her dues. Yes. Uh, I want to thank you all for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen today. For your second listen today, check out Locked On Sports Today. From the games that matter to the most and biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. And make sure, as long as Twitter continues to exist, that you follow James K at James underscore M underscore K, K A Y, that is for our audio only listeners. James is indispensable to cover and an all around great guy, too. So make sure you are following his work. Uh, tomorrow, you have a an upgrade in the host chairs. The great Jackie Powell will be taking you through Friday and into the weekend when we have our WNBA draft coverage on Saturday, as always, with the trio. So until then, James, thank you as always. To our listeners, thank you as always. I am Howard Megdahl, wishing you all a wonderful day. Welcome to Wallet. For the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. 